We've now heard about crime and we've heard about interrogations and that naturally leads us into our next talk uh, which is about the way neuroscience interfaces with law. To talk about that is Stephen Morse who is a professor of law as well as a professor of psychology and psychiatry and he'll uh, tell us about the way neuroscience is currently being used in law and the way in which it might be used in the future. Stephen? Thanks, Anjan. Thanks for being with us. Uh, many people think that the astonishing new discoveries of neuroscience threaten all conceptions of legal responsibility. It's been referred to a couple of times already today. My message is very simple. It doesn't. Certainly not yet and maybe never. Before I get into the uh, body of my talk, I should say that so far neuroscience does not seem to be used all that much in the courtroom. It's said anecdotally that it's used in death penalty cases, but again, there are no hard data about that. I think in the future it will certainly be used more. Brains don't kill people or commit other crimes. People kill people or commit other crimes. We don't praise and blame, punish and reward brains. We praise and blame, we punish and reward conscious, intentional, potentially rational people who have done wrong. It is simply incorrect to think that just because one can demonstrate that brain states, including abnormal brain states, play a causal role in be explaining criminal behavior, that the behavior must necessarily be excused. The criteria for responsibility are actions and mental states. Murder, for example, is intentionally engaging in killing conduct with the intention to kill. These criteria are not brain states. And contrary to what many people think, free will is not a criterion for criminal responsibility. It's not even foundational for it. Brain states are always part of the causal explanation for human behavior. If your brain is dead, you're dead, and you're not acting at all. If brain causation excused, no one would be responsible for anything. Causation at any level of explanation, whether it's biological, psychological, sociological, or astrological, causation at any level is not an excusing condition per se. The basic criterion for non-responsibility legally, roughly, is the lack of capacity to act rationally. If you think about the classes of people who we now consider less or non-responsible, children, some people with severe mental disorder, people with dementias, they all either as a result of the developmental process or some abnormality lack the full capacity for rationality. Unless the brain evidence validly demonstrates that the defendant lacked rational capacity, the brain evidence is irrelevant to law. Even if an abnormal brain state played a causal role, the defendant will still be responsible if he acted consciously, intentionally, and with reasonable, rational capacity. Because the criteria for responsibility are actions and mental states, the best evidence will be behavioral. If the evidence is in conflict, that is, what looks to be the case on the scan seems somehow inconsistent with what you see behaviorally, you always have to believe the behavior because legal criteria are behavioral, broadly speaking. In a word, actions speak louder than images. We don't need brain images, for example, to know that adolescents are less rational than adults. We've known that forever. And I think, for instance, the Supreme Court in deciding whether uh, people who committed capital murder when they were 16 or 17 should be categorically excluded from capital punishment. The Supreme Court was right to hold that adolescents are different. There's fantastic behavioral evidence, as if we needed it, that they are. And I think the brain evidence added in that case very little. And in the event, the Supreme Court didn't cite it. Until neuroscience demonstrates something that I think is unlikely, that human beings are not conscious, not intentional, not potentially rational creatures, the sorts of creatures we now take ourselves to be, creatures who act for reasons, I doubt that neuroscience is ever likely to demonstrate that responsibility is impossible for creatures like us. I think the person, as we know the person, has not disappeared, and we, that criminal responsibility is secure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And that concludes our presentation today. Uh, we thank you for joining us. If you have additional questions as follow-ups to these presentations, please contact Penn. Hello. I'm Jordan Reese, Manager of Science Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. 
feel free to contact me at the information on your screen for faculty in the School of Arts and Sciences, Natural Sciences, Veterinary Medicine, or Engineering. Also, feel free to return back to this website, the web address is on your screen, for future webcasts, which will be broadcast live, as well as for webcasts we've archived. Again, thank you for joining us.